Assalamu alaikum this is Dr. Hasna with Hasna's Not Me and today we're going to be studying these three topics. Really hope you subscribe to my channel because I make anatomy simple and super easy for you with mnemonics and easy ways to memorize the topics of anatomy. So do not forget to subscribe to my channel. I assure you all topics that you've ever studied will become a piece of cake. So let's get started with the first topic, the rectus sheath. So what is the rectus sheath? We have already studied in our abdominal muscle videos. If you haven't watched that yet, go ahead and click the link in the description. In that video, I gave a brief introduction of the rectus sheath. We have a rectus abdominis muscle. It's a vertical muscle that runs from below your pubic crest all the way up to your costal cartilage. If we take a cut section, cross section of it, this rectus abdominis is surrounded by a sheath. It is an aponeurotic sheath. And it is formed by the interweaving of the various eponeuroses of the muscles of the abdominal wall. These we've studied, the external oblique, internal oblique, the transversus abdominis muscles. These muscles, their eponeuroses are actually responsible for forming the rectus sheath. So let's go ahead and talk about how the rectus sheath is exactly formed. So the rectus sheath has an anterior wall and a posterior wall and we can divide the rectus abdominis muscle into three locations the part which is above the costal margin from the costal margin up to the arcuate line and then we have the third part which is below the arcuate line why are these divisions necessary because the anterior and posterior wall differ in their compositions on all of these locations so let's see the story how it goes we all know that this rectus abdominis runs from the pubic crest of the hip bone all the way up to your costal cartilages. Let's take cross section of this rectus abdominis in all of these three locations. All right, I really hope you remember where the arcuate line is. It is a point midway between the pubic symphysis and the umbilicus. Right here is where the arcuate line is formed. Let's take a cut section of the rectus abdominis above the costal margin. Above the costal margin, if this is the rectus abdominis, here it's quite obvious that it is lying directly on the 5th, 6th and 7th costal cartilages. 5th, 6th and 7th costal cartilages are going to be forming the posterior part of the rectus abdominis. While the anterior wall is formed by the external oblique eponeurosis. So we all remember the external oblique muscle. It began from right here, outer surfaces of the lower ribs. And it also formed the anterior part of the rectus sheath in the entirety of the muscle. So remember one thing that the external oblique will be lying in the anterior wall in all parts. Here we can safely say that the anterior wall is formed by the eponeurosis of the external oblique. Posterior wall is deficient and the rectus abdominis is directly lying on the 5th, 6th and 7th costal cartilages. And see what happens below the costal margin of the arcuate line. We studied this in the muscles of the abdomen. In the muscle of the abdomen, we remember there was the external oblique and then we had the internal oblique. And in internal oblique below the costal margin up to the arcuate line split into an anterior and a posterior lamina. I hope you remember. Hence, the anterior lamina went in front of the rectus abdominis, whereas the posterior lamina went behind the rectus abdominis. And therefore, that is how your anterior and posterior walls were formed. There was another muscle, the transversus abdominis. This was also accompanying the posterior lamina of the internal oblique. So here, when we see from the costal margin up to the arcuate line, the anterior wall is formed by the external oblique aponeurosis. The anterior lamina of the internal oblique represented by this wavy line. Let's suppose this is the internal oblique. And the posterior wall is formed by the posterior lamina of the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. So now we know the anterior wall is formed by the eponeurosis of the external oblique and the anterior lamina of the internal oblique. Whereas the posterior wall is formed by the posterior lamina of the internal oblique transversus abdominis eponeurosis. Let's talk about below the arcuate line. What is the arcuate line? Well, it is a crescentic line which marks. Basically, it marks the point where the posterior wall of the rectus sheath 
ends and that occurs because the internal oblique now no longer has a posterior lamina and when it will end and even the transversus abdominis aponeurosis will shift to the anterior side therefore there will be a crescentic margin two aponeurosis have ended and below this the fascia transversalis will be seen only why because below the transversus abdominis lies what layer the fascia transversalis which we'll discuss in a while so below the arcuate line now we know that the anterior wall is formed by all of the three aponeurosis namely the external oblique the anterior lamina of the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis whereas posteriorly the wall is deficient it is lying directly on the fascia transversalis remember it's an aponeurosis that is forming the rectus sheath not the muscles itself what is the linea alba i'm sure now you know very well that all of the flat muscles aponeurosis will basically be decussating in the anterior median line this decussation causes a median fibrous raft to be formed called the linea alba. Now let's discuss the various contents of the rectus sheath. In the rectus sheath lie very obvious the rectus abdominis muscles plus the pyramidalis that we studied. What other? There are two important arteries that lie in the rectus sheath. These are the superior epigastric and the inferior epigastric arteries that we'll discuss in a while. And we then we have the terminal parts of the lower six intercostal nerves you also call these thoracoabdominal nerves moreover the rectus sheath basically has two major function increases the efficiency of the rectus abdominis muscle which means it makes it stronger and secondly it increases the strength of the anterior abdominal wall point of interest is that the anterior wall of the rectus sheath is strongly adherent to the rectus abdominis whereas the posterior wall is free from the rectus abdominis why because in the anterior wall lie the tendinous intersections of the rectus abdominis this again i have talked about in my uh, abdominal muscle video so that was all about the rectus sheath let's move on and talk about the fascia transversalis what is the fascia transversalis so all your abdominal muscles are lined by a fascia so let's say external oblique, the inner surface of the external oblique is lined by fascia. The internal oblique, its inner surface is lined by fascia. And then the transversus abdominis has an inner surface also lined by a fascia. In case of transversus abdominis, the inner surface which is lined by fascia, this fascia has a name and that name is called the fascia transversalis. So what is the fascia transversalis? It is the fascia lining the inner surface of the transversus abdominis muscle. So where does the fascia transversalis extend to? Here I'd like you to focus on this image right here. Anteriorly, the fascia transversalis is adherent to the linea alba, but above the umbilicus, not below the umbilicus. Posteriorly, what happens is that posteriorly, I want you to focus on this image. Here you can see this is the thoracolumbar fascia. Imagine this is the posterior side of the abdominal wall. This is the anterior side. So you can see the posterior side. There is a thoracolumbar fascia in the posterior wall of your lumbar region. This is known as a thoracolumbar fascia. This has an anterior layer. So posteriorly, your fascia transversalis is continuous with the anterior layer only. Only with the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia. And is continuous with the renal fascia. Posteriorly is the thoracolumbar fascia and the renal fascia. Above, you know, is the diaphragm. So the fascia transversalis above is continuous with the diaphragmatic fascia. Simple. Inferiorly is the fascia iliaca surrounding your pelvis area. Inferiorly, it is continuous with the fascia iliaca and itself the fascia transversalis is attached to the inner lip of the iliac crest which we have discussed previously so superiorly was the diaphragmatic fascia and inferiorly is the fascia iliaca where it is continuous with the various fascias of all the regions all right medially there is also a part of the fascia transversalis which basically is attached to the pubic tubercle and the pubic crest the medial part also has a prolongation down into the thigh as the femoral sheath. What is a modification in the fascia transversalis? Very important. So this is the inguinal ligament. This is the mid-inguinal point. Just 1.2 cm above this mid-inguinal point is an opening. This opening is known as the deep inguinal ring. And this opening is in the 
fascia transversalis all right we've all studied the superficial inguinal ring was an opening in the external oblique epineurosis whereas the deep inguinal ring was an opening in the fascia transversalis just above the mid inguinal point remember one important point about this opening is that this opening lies lateral to the inferior epigastric artery what are the various prolongations or extensions of the fascia transversalis? I want you all to remember that from the deep inguinal ring passes a very important structure. In males, this is the spermatic cord. And in the females, this is the round ligament of uterus. Let me just give you a summary of the inguinal canal. The deep inguinal ring from the fascia transversalis opening coming to a more superficial part, which is the triangular perture, the superficial inguinal ring. Between these two rings, moving from lateral to medial or moving from deep to superficial is the inguinal canal. And through this inguinal canal in males passes the spermatic cord and in the female passes the round ligament. What happens is when the spermatic cord is passing inside the inguinal canal, the fascia transversalis prolongs around this spermatic cord. It prolongs to form the internal spermatic fascia. So that is the first prolongation of the fascia transversalis, meaning the fascia transversalis extends with the spermatic cord as the internal spermatic fascia. The second prolongation, as we just talked about, in the medial side, it goes down into the thigh to form the anterior wall of the femoral sheath that we studied in the lower limb. We all remember the anterior wall of the femoral sheath formed by the fascia transversalis. Also, another important thing about the fascia transversalis is that all the main arteries of the abdominal wall lie inside the fascia transversalis and the nerves will lie outside of it. Therefore, in the femoral sheath that we studied, the vessels, the big femoral artery and the vein, they lie inside the sheath. Whereas the femoral nerve lied outside the sheath. Let me go through a summary of the fascia transversalis. The fascia transversalis is the fascia that lines the inner surface of the transversus abdominis. And its boundaries are that anteriorly it is adherent to the linea alba above the umbilicus. The posteriorly it merges with the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia and is continuous with the renal fascia. Superiorly with the diaphragmatic fascia, inferiorly with the fascia iliaca. And medially it forms the anterior wall of the femoral sheath. Apart from this, a modification in the fascia transversalis is the deep inguinal ring lying 1.2 centimeter above the mid inguinal point and it lies lateral to the epigastric artery. Two extensions of the fascia transversalis include the internal spermatic fascia around the spermatic cord and the anterior wall of the femoral sheath. So we have discussed the fascia transversalis. So a few important arteries of the abdominal wall include the two branches, the musculophrenic and the superior epigastric artery. These two are branches of the internal thoracic artery. I hope you all remember these came from the anterior thoracic wall. The internal thoracic artery basically gave superior epigastric artery. The superior epigastric artery runs between the costal and xephoid origins of the diaphragm. Basically, when the diaphragm is arising from the costal and the xephoid locations, between them, the superior epigastric artery passes down into the rectus sheath and it forms an important content of the rectus sheath. The superior epigastric artery goes below and anastomoses with the inferior epigastric artery. Now let's talk about how inferior epigastric artery is coming. Inferior epigastric artery basically comes from the external iliac artery. What was its relation with the deep inguinal ring? I've already mentioned it runs medial to the deep inguinal ring. And then it passes upwards. It pierces the fascia transversalis. And in front of the arcuate line, it passes and enters your rectus sheath. And once it enters the rectus sheath, it forms an important content of it. It goes above and anastomosis with the superior epigastric artery. So the major arterial supply of the anterior abdominal wall is the superior and inferior epigastric artery. Apart from that, the musculophrenic artery. Another was the deep circumflex iliac artery. And there are other small intercostal and subcostal arteries. All right. Another important point of the inferior epigastric artery are its branches. It gives the cremasteric branch, the pubic branch, which anastomoses with the pubic branch of the obturator artery, some cutaneous and some muscular branches. Now that pubic branch that it was giving, that was going to anastomose with the obturator artery's pubic branch, sometimes it replaces that obturator artery and it becomes itself the abnormal obturator artery. 
I hope you remember we studied this in the lower limb. So it is this branch, the pubic branch of the epigastric artery that is actually the abnormal obturator artery that in surgeries of the femoral hernia, if it gets ruptured, then it can result in death. So we're done with today's topics. I really hope you understood each and every part. I will keep uploading videos and making anatomy a piece of cake for you. So guys, do subscribe to my channel, leave a like and comment. And thank you so much for watching.